Hi, everyone. How are you? And welcome to another NCBS Community Conversation. We are so honored and privileged tonight to have a phenomenal panel of speakers, as you can all see. However, the feature tonight is Dr. Michelle Dunlap. Dr. Dunlap um, also presented with us at our conference this past March, and we heard so many great things about her presentation. We just had to invite her for a community conversation. Um, you know, I stopped to her table, she was selling books, and Everything was amazing. So at this time, I would love to formally introduce Dr. Michelle Dunlap, who is an educator, diversity consultant, speaker, trainer, author, writing coach, and a diversity of farming evangelist. As we can all see, this sister is very busy. She was born and raised in, Detro in Detroit, Michigan. She earned her bachelor's of science degrees with honors in psychology, from Wayne State University, a master's in social psychology with an emphasis in consumer behavior and a PhD in social psychology with an emphasis in prejudice, racism, and intergroup relations from the University of Florida. She is an emeritus professor of human development at Connecticut College, having taught there for 28 years from 1994 to 2022. So congratulations on your recent retirement, a goal that we all have. She is an author our, um, and co-editor of 50 journal articles, books, chapters, and essays on the topics of retail racism, cultural competency, racial identity development, provider engagement with children and families, service learning, and community engagement. Also, multicultural issues and diversity, adolescent development, and emerging adulthood, and tenure track success. At this time, I would love to formally um, start this conversation and simply just begin by asking Dr. Dunlap, what was your purpose and motivation behind writing this book, Retail Racism? Thank you, Dr. Fontenet. And I would just first just like to take a moment to thank everyone who's here and especially if um, any of my family or friends are here. I'm not able to see uh, who the audience is, but I just want to add to what Dr. Fontenet said in terms of welcome. And again, I'm honored uh, for everyone who's in attendance. So what was my motivation? This was a bit of a deviation from my normal uh, work. I normally uh, write about um, college students and adolescents and how they adjust when they're going into communities that they might not be totally familiar with. Um, and about uh, African-American parenting and child rearing and things like that. So the Retail Racism book is a bit of a departure from the other four books that I've been involved with. Um, the motivation for this book is that there were some heartbreaking experiences that um, I observed or that I was a part of myself that I saw up close and personally that really, really hurt me deeply and especially um, concerned me because I was worried about the traumatic impact on children, families, adults, and communities of incidences when we go out and try to conduct business in the marketplace. So as I was writing this book as sort of a a protest against what I had been seeing and observing. I also went across the country and interviewed people from different parts of the country about their experiences. But again, while all of that was going on, we had things going on like Trayvon Martin going to a store, coming back from a store. We had George Floyd in a store, um, coming out of a store. Um, we had the Starbucks incident. We've had horrors happen at Walmarts. We've had Waffle House incident, just incident after incident after incident. I came across hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles, um, current events that were going on while I was writing the book. And even when we think of the pandemic, us being consumers during the pandemic, consumers of medical care, 
consumers of health services, consumers of, of drugstores, of medications and things like that. So many inequities wound up in that as well. So my book actually came out during the pandemic. Um, so there was an issue that I saw our families and communities being negatively impacted by. I wanted to understand it better. I wanted to protest it. And so I interviewed people. I researched the topic. I wrote a book. And that is basically my motivation. It's really for the children. It's really for us. It's really for our entire community and beyond. It's to educate people, the people in power, and to comfort those who are not in power. Thank you so much for making, yes, and, and, and thank you so much for making that connection for us because we see the racism, we see the violence, we see the death of Black bodies. Mm -hmm. Very few of us really connect that dot to these incidents happening during transactions, monetary transactions, or the thought of the lack thereof, right? Mm -hmm. um, a few months ago, I had the privilege to meet Trayvon Martin's mother. She came to do a lecture at the University of Delaware, where I am. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing to hear her side of the story as a mother. Mm -hmm. And to just think about the simple daily task of how, how many of us growing up were told by our grandmother, our mom, our auntie, hey, go run to the store and grab an onion real quick. I'm cooking. Go. Like mm -hmm. we just send our kids out to the store because we know it's a safe Aaron and you're running it then um, in addition to when we send them to the store they do so on their own mm -hmm. and we just never truly make the the connection that our children are in danger when they're just simply going to run an errand for us um thank you so much for making that connection and I really see our listeners to tonight's conversation taking just that part already home with them or wherever they are and thinking more about it. Um, of course, this is a topic where we have many people interested, many other scholars, writers. And tonight we also have Dr. Brian Ragsdale with us. We also have Mr. Kenneth Watts with us. And um, they are actually here um, based on Dr. Dunlap's suggestion as we were preparing for her talk. And I really just want to um, use this time to just say that I am grateful for all of you taking the time to see NCBS as an important platform to have these conversations, mm -hmm. but also to understand that community conversations simply must happen and be willing to expand tonight's conversation with your all's contribution. So thank you so much. And um, Dr. Dunlap, um, as these gentlemen are your distinguished guest. Um, I would love to turn the floor over to you to please introduce them. Okay, Dr. Fontenet, before I do, if I may, I just want to add something to what you said about sending our children to the store. And I, as I was mentioning Trayvon Martin and George Floyd and, and, and so many others, I would like to mention most recently, there's 14-year-old Cyrus Carmack Belton, a 14-year-old um, who uh, lived in Columbia, South Carolina, who last week went to a convenience store and the convenience store owner, a 50 year old uh, owner thought that uh, little Cirrus, 14 year old had stolen a bottle of water. And he had not stolen a bottle of water, but even if he had stolen a bottle of water, is not a human life worth more than a bottle of water? He shot 14-year-old Cyrus in the back and killed him. And he has been arrested for murder. And I believe it's first degree murder because um, it was not an accident. It was not manslaughter. He made a decision when you shoot someone in the back, that is not um, a, an accident of any kind. So this 14 year old child, we, we, we think our children should be safe to run to the store and pick up something. Um, you know, and here 
he is dead over a bottle of water. So I want to say that, but I will also move on. Thank so you. That um, excuse me real quick, um, Dr. Dunlop. I think I did hear about that. Is that the gentleman who, who like his son was with him chasing this young man as well? I don't want to. You know, I'm not sure about that detail. Okay. I'm not I sure mention his ethnicity, but I do remember seeing something okay. about a store owner and his son chasing someone out of their store trying to shoot. Okay. Him. Wow. So. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah. I apologize. The articles okay. that I read, I didn't hear about a son, but there very well could have been. Or unfortunately, we don't know if it could be a whole nother incident. These incidences are happening so frequently. Yeah. And the fear that it that that it instills in parents, no one could possibly, well, I won't say no one could understand, but but it is a unique, it's a unique anxiety, a unique fear every time we send our children out the door. I can honestly say that I raised two children who are now grown men, but there is not one time they left our household without me praying for them before they went out that door. Um, because I could pretty much predict what they're gonna experience inside the house, but outside of the house feels like Russian roulette to many black parents. So anyway, having said that, I want to uh, do the honors of introducing one of um, our other panelists, and then I will um, introduce our last panelist a little later into um, uh, into our program here. So we have with us Dr. Brian Ragsdale. He's an Associate Dean in the Office of Institutional Effectiveness at Walden University, where he leads and consults a number of persistence and retention programs. He is CEO of his own so Social Science Institute. He's a licensed clinical psychologist a clinical researcher and health disparities scholar with NIH and National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities Institute, um, having received their funding at times. He is a peer reviewed published uh, psychologist having published in the American Psychologist Journal of Youth, Adolescence and Child Development Journal and has shared his work and more than 40 national and international conferences. He also is an accomplished painter, writer, singer, and songwriter. So I believe that he has joined our panel today to offer some reflections from a clinical psychological point of view on this topic of retail racism, shopping while black and brown in America. Thank you so much for introducing Dr. Ragsdale. Um, and Dr. Ragsdale, I know you've already prepared comments, but um, in addition to the comments you've already prepared, if you can please also offer your perspective on the psychological impact for young Black children, um, as well as for Black mothers. Because um, one thing I did notice about Dr. Dunlap's book as well, which um, we're going to get to a bit later, is that you dedicated this book to the exonerated, um, exonerated five. And we know that they were children. I don't care if they were 16, 17 and viewed as, you know, a, a few viewed as men, they were children. So again, we see this pattern here. And, and some were as young as 12, and some were as young as 12, 13, experiencing a trauma that they did not deserve for something that they had absolutely nothing to do with. Their innocence was ripped from them for no good reason other than the color of their skin. Um, so I'm not sure that they have completely recovered from that. I know that one is faring pretty well, uh, you, Youssef Salam, but I'm not sure about the others. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Radsdale. You're on mute, Dr. Radsdale. Do I get any extra points for being on the being unmuted. I'm so sorry. I'm just, I'm saying, usually I get points if I, you know, if I do that. But, but thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. And um, to respond to the one of the things I think about the family as a connected, uh, as a connected group, a unit, 
in our communities. And so what, whatever happens to the child ha then also happens to the ancestors, then happens to the childs that are unborn, that happens to the mother, the father, the uncle, the aunt. So one of the constellations that I think about is when one of us is harmed or hurt in these ways, it impacts all of us on some level in some way. And um, we know, for example, in many, in, in, in a lot of our communities, in all of our communities, children are revered and, and cared for by the neighbors, by the ministers, the pastors, the teachers, and so forth. And so the trauma experience, the stress experience of going to a, a public space, and this is the thing for African Americans, people of color, a lot of historically marginalized folks. But for this conversation, I'm focusing on Af African-Americans. <clears throat> there is a, there are a few uh, safe spaces for us, whether it's in private spaces or public. And because of the nature of our enslavement, uh, the nature of our enslavement meant that we really didn't have any private nor public space. And so the specter, this fear of trauma, trauma existing in a place that there is uh, some capital being exchanged. This has been part of our lives as Blacks who have been enslaved in, our, in this country. Anytime we get any proximity to money and exchange in money, our lives on some level are at risk. You know, that's, that's like, whoa, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we try to go to the mortgage and try to get housing, we try all the, all the other, other ways that we're impacted. But the retail racism is especially traumatic because when we're with, uh, we're shopping or doing something with our families, it's typically around something of happiness. You know, you're you're buying something, you're bringing something for someone else. It's a gift. It's something that you. It's a happy moment. So when you have these experiences of racism, it adds to, it can add to PTSD. It also adds on to our our existing trauma and stress already racialized trauma and stress, which we know now is an actual uh, fact in our, in our lives and, and contributes to all types of things, depression, anxiety, uh, it impacts our sleep, uh, it impacts mm -hmm. our, even uh, how we dream and so forth, intrusive thoughts, intrusive memories. So the fact that this could happen at a store and then when it does happen, that means that the person then can associate that experience with any store that they go into. And this is why many of us, when we go into the stores, we're like, we take a deep breath. We, you know, we just, we just do. We just, I know I do. I mean, I just, I take a deep breath because I don't know what's going to, what's going to happen. I want to get in and I want to get out. So I think, I think I answered your, your question. Uh, I think I answered your question, but I wanted to underscore that this is an ongoing, and and this is why I love the book so much, because it looks at the lifespan of how we have been act, impacted by retail racism. And Dr. Dunlap does a, a superb job, I believe, I know, in bringing forward the research that amplifies the actual lived experience of folks. That's why the book is such an, an exciting, well, exciting is not the right word to say. That's the wrong word to say, but it's, it's informational, it's knowledge, because you're hearing the voice of people's experience along with the research that also um, amplifies this experience. I would like to add something to what to what you said, Dr. Ragsdale. You did amplify or um, center the shopping experience, and the title of the book centers that. But this extends to other experiences in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, when we go to buy a car, I, I think you mentioned when we go to buy a house, when we go to get insurance, when we make an, in, an insurance claim. Um, insurance adjusters, uh, there's some reason to think that not all insurance adjusters are going to be equitable, unfortunately, in how they handle um, um, the insurance claims. Um, when we go to any kind of establishment or try to conduct any kind of um, transaction, like you said, Dr. Ragsdale, inviting in, uh, uh, um, concerning an exchange yes. of money, yes. uh, of, or money or goods or services or whatever. So 
just so that we're not thinking only about shopping. It involves so many different realms of life. When we go to eat at a restaurant, where do they sit us? How do they, how do they show us our food and hand, hand us our food? If we have a complaint, how are we responded to? Things like that. Who are they watching while we eat? Who are they not watching while we eat? Um, and so forth. So the book deals with, uh, with all of that. So I wanna thank you, Dr. Ragsdale, for helping us to understand um, just little tiny bit how this is a psycho, psych, psycho, excuse me, social psychological issue that has a vicarious and a traumatic impact, not just a vicariously traumatic impact, but a self-traumatic impact when it happens to us. But when it happens to anyone, it also happens to us because of the vicarious impact. So I thank you very much, Dr. Bagsdale. And can I just uh, also add another complexity is that as we were talking about this, 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 this phenom, right? And I, and I, I agree, it's a systemic uh, issue that, that's impacted all types of institutions and transactions. I agree. And that's, you know, I want to underscore and support that. The also other heartbreaking thing for me in doing work with children and families is that parents then have to socialize their children or teach their children about this phenom. And often, as you know, parents come in and they don't know at what age should they have this discussion. And that itself as a phenom for, for Black parents to have to know, to, to come in and say, okay, I need to have this conversation. You know, how do I bring this conversation to my child in a way, because up until this point, I've been able to keep them safe. But I realize now, since they have to go into stores and they're like, most children are very excited when they're going to the store. They're like, oh, I get to, I get something. But then the, the parent then has to, to think and decide, how do I help the child understand that their behavior is going to be observed differently than what their internal subjective experience of the, so which is like a, a way of trying to teach children how to have an internal emotional sense and also the perception of what an external, so how someone else can view, which when that task is a, a extremely difficult task, but many African-American children actually uh, have learned how to do this thing that I'm trying to describe, kind of clumsily, I'm sure, but. Thank you, thank you so much. Again, Dr. Ragsdale, these are all such important issues. So I believe that uh, Dr. Fontenet has another question for me, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I have um, quite a few, um, and I may not be able to get to all of them. Um, and, and of course, these, these questions range from you know, um, different aspects and perspectives of the um, text. And Dr. Ragsdale, um, you are definitely right when you say systemic is a part of this because what Dr. Dunlap's book does is creates a larger conversation across America and it really could be across the you know around the diaspora when it comes to Black people and our experiences so navigating the reality of systemic racism in retail and what I really find um somewhat troubling is that people, human beings, I don't wanna say black people, human beings, we tend not to think something can happen to us until it happens to us or someone close to us. And what your text does is connects people all across America by saying, hey, we, we all experience this. We experience it in different ways. So I wanted to ask you through your interviews and all the conversations you had, are you able to identify one or two that just really stood out the most to you or one that was just even unbelievable for you to hear as you were writing this book? Um, are you able to do that for us? Wow, well, I, I did. Um, there, there's 19 interviews in the book and each one is so powerful. It's really 
hard for me to pick one, but I'm gonna try. Um, there was an African-American woman elder, a senior citizen who was shopping and in a store and someone thought that she stole an undergarment and they escorted her to um, sound like some dungeon catacombs of the store, you know, down in the basement somewhere, some dark dungeon type place and um, berated her and threatened her. And, um, you know, she ended up disrobing and showing her, I don't have anything, you know, would you let me go? And eventually they ended up assaulting her. And, you know, to think that an elder would be wrongly accused of stealing something, but then berated, emotionally threatened, and then physically assaulted, all in the course of trying to transact some simple business. It's appalling. And many of the stories um, have that kind of traumatic twist to it. I put all of the traumatic stories in one section. So when you read that section, you might wanna do some extra self-care. Um, there's a section on monitoring. These are where folks are talking about their experiences of being followed around. And some of them do some funny things to confront those who are monitoring them, fight back. They have ways of fighting back, creative ways of fighting back that will make you laugh, that will make you feel like, yes. <laughs> um, but that some things that might also make you sad. Um, then there's a section on inequities and um, where maybe someone sees they're trying to uh, turn in uh, return some vitamins with the receipt at a grocery store and someone else is returning a whole rug at a grocery store with no receipt. And like, who sells rugs at a grocery store? Um, and, you know, so the Black person's experience versus a white person's experience in these contexts can be very different. Then there's the trauma section, and that's where things like um, the police show up with their hand on their gun, like they might do something at any second um, for no good reason, um, or where someone gets assaulted or something like that. And then the last section is the philosophy section. And this, these are the interviews where people make really, really good sense out of what's happening. They put it in a larger framework and they bring um, activism into it, they bring philosophy into it, they bring spirituality into it. They really, all the stories show our strength, but in the philosophy section, the level of strength that is shown in that section is just incredible. Um, so uh, to, answer, to answer your question, it would be hard, it's hard to pick out one, but I tried to give you a couple of examples and sort of an overview. And there's a lot of humor interweaved throughout. Um, so some people are telling me they, re they read the book in one sitting, they read it and they can't put it down. And other people say that they have to read it in doses. They might read one section one day, another section another day, because they have to kind of, and you know, we're used to that. We're used to having to pace ourselves when it comes to trauma, you know? Um, and then other folks are saying that they jump around the book and that's fine. The book is structured in, in a way that you can jump around. Also each section, each of those four sections has recommendations for marketers so that they can do their job better so that they can do their job more equitably. But then it also has suggestions for those of us who are doing the, the uh, shopping and the dealing with the banks and, and so forth, so that when we feel we are not being treated equitably, 
will have a repertoire of ideas, of strategies, of things that we can do, be it saying, I'm not investing my money here, I'm out, or be it filing a complaint, or be it um, any number of things. But, but there's a lot of strategies that, are, that can escalate, that, that can escalate the pressure that gets put on, um, uh, on a marketer. And that is shown throughout the book, but then also summarized at the end. So I gear the book both towards the consumer, but also towards the marketer so that they can do a better job at serving everybody and making the marketplace more equitable for everyone. Thank um, you so much. And you're right. Um, after I read Latasha's story, I had to put it down and, and I had been reading pretty consistently, you know, and mm -hmm. after I read her story, I had to sit for a bit. And when we talk about that trauma of not only our kids, Dr. Ragsdale, but going back to that trauma of Black motherhood, again, yeah. something that is supposed to be joyful, um, something that is supposed to be praised, something that we are not supposed to fear. And the reality is that we don't have the same privilege as white mothers when it comes to motherhood. Mm -hmm. And her story literally you know, brought me to tears. And of course I have a black son, mm -hmm. he thinks, and everyone always says he's precious. And I always say this, when will he no longer be precious to you all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the fact that that reality is mm -hmm. coming. Um, right. and, and that's something that I can't prevent from happening, unfortunately. So um, to our viewers, when you do read this, this book, it's, it's phenomenal because it forces you again to, be able to identify what is happening, what can happen, what has been happening, but also you're going to see pieces of your own life and mm -hmm. I need to be careful or I experienced this and we probably didn't even realize it was a traumatic experience. But like Dr. Mm -hmm. Axel said, are you paying attention to the little things you do when you walk into a store or any establishment? Do you already go in knowing that if I complain about my order, they're going to say, oh, they're just trying to get something free or, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's just this systemic thought that's been ingrained in everyone when it comes to us as Black people. Um, so thank you so much. Yes. Absolutely. And there are things that we can do. And those are definitely, the, the book is chock full of that. Um, also, I wanted to just say, when you mentioned Latasha's stories, each story is named, given a pseudonym for someone who in, 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 in our history has been um, treated horribly or even lost their lives in the marketplace. So in their memory, I um, use pseudonyms um, that consist of real historical figures, but they are the stories of the people who are interviewed. So I keep my participants, I keep their confidentiality. I don't tell you who those participants are. And one way that I'm able to guard their privacy is by giving them pseudonyms. But I didn't just pick any pseudonym. I picked pseudonyms that had meaning. So we have like a Renisha, we, we have Latasha, we have uh, Trayvon. So, so we have um, a lot of names to help us remember that these are real things that happen to real people and have cost people their lives, people who will never be able to read this book, hopefully will be reminded of them. So yes, does um, that bring us to our next item? Yes, well, it brings me to my next question because I'm happy you mentioned how you named. And um, for those of you who've been keeping up with our conversations, you all know I pay attention to not just the content, but how um, you know our guests write. And I noticed that in your table of contents, each section, you name it one thing, monitoring, but then every chapter has that M, right? And um, I actually realized, I was like, hmm, I wonder why she did that. And I think I know why, because when I look mm -hmm. at monitoring, you have misperceived, mistrusted, mortified, managed, right? Like what happens when one is monitored and how does it make feel, and, right? And so I name each story 
like misperceived or, um, you, you know, I, I give each story a name to remind us, like you said, under monitoring, there's all these things that can happen. And then I also give each person who I interviewed, I give them that very significant pseudonym as well, so that we are reminded of history, that this is grounded in a long legacy of historical events, historical traumas that we would not expect to happen in, in our society. We, we in, 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 especially in the new millennium, we would not expect, but they happen over and over and over and over again. So should I go ahead on to the next thing? Yes, please. Okay, so um, one thing that you'll see, there's some fabulous artwork, poetry, photographs in the book because I am a big supporter of the arts. And I believe that we learn not just through the written word, but also through a lot of different mediums. And, and I think most of us really do know that. Um, you, you know, life just kind of teaches us that. So um, the cover of the uh, book has a very, very uh, powerful photo that actually was conceived of by a high school student and carried out. She did it in her, she did that photograph in at the front and back cover photograph in her photography class in high school. She's now a student at Spelman University. Tila Avery is her name, a, fa a fantastic photographer. She's in Japan right now. So I was hoping she, she could be here tonight. But one of the photographs that she took is one that I requested. Um, as I was finishing up the book, we had our president at that time putting a stop to the Harriet Tubman $20 bill in honor of the year 2020. We were expecting a Harriet Tubman $20 bill, but it was squashed. And so people were stamping $20 bills. I did it too with Harriet Tubman's picture. And it was going all into the, you, you, you getting all mixed up with regular $20 bills. And it was creating a, a a bit of a challenge for our uh, currency exchange and so forth. But anyway, that was a way that people protested. So I asked her if she would do a picture of a Harriet Tubman $20 bill and she did. So that's one of the pictures that's in the book. But in the meantime, one of our poets wrote a poem about the Harriet Tubman $20 bill. And that's Mr. Kenneth Watts, our other panelist. Mr. Kenneth Watts is an accomplished civil servant, minister, singer, poet, and artist who is working on a compilation of his poems and those poems will be interspersed with his art images. So I introduce to you Mr. Kenneth Watts who will be sharing his poem. Hello everybody. I just want to first thank Okay, wait a minute. Can you mute me, Dr. Frontnet? Can you mute me? Can you hear me okay? Let me try. You will have to turn the volume down on your computer as well, Dr. Dunlap. All right, I think we saw. Said okay. Can you hear me, guys? Can you guys hear me okay? Wonderful. Let me first. Thank uh, Dr. Dunlap uh, for allowing me to participate on this platform. She's very passionate about her endeavor and I'm very proud of her, known her for a long time. I met Dr. Rasdell uh, a few months ago. It's really good to see you. And also it's a pleasure meeting you, Dr. Alicia. I wish you the very best in your endeavor also. So my poem, please don't be offended, but I have worked, I have worked really hard to maintain my superior art my superiority. I went as far as to capture a generation of people and label them inferior. On their backs, they built my world and I stood on top of the mountain and called myself king. Somehow you managed to escape my stronghold and began to elevate in all arenas. I fought, I fight, I fear, trampling on every sprout and grain of guilt that America has bring, brought forth. How dare you motion that your image be placed on an article of wealth? 
for it was that very image that defied my enslavement, my enslavement of you and help others to escape to freedom. How great the risk, the risk should the bank teller hand me a 20 and there you are, the image of possibility, the Shawshank Redemption. The humiliation felt when today's KKK member picks up his robe from the cleaners and pays the cashier with currency with her face staring at him. Those things that were once that were once out of sight, out of mind, will be on every home, every town, every city, every state, everywhere. Thank you very much. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Wells, for that. So, Dr. Fontenette, I think you're on now. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for that poem. And of course, as a scholar, I can't help but to think the connectedness to the text we're talking about this idea of well, this reality of retail racism, the 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 reality of the experience of Black people in America being that for economic gain for Europeans, and then to still deny a Black woman who sacrificed her life countless times to save Black people denied on currency. And I can't help but now to think about this idea of currency and what it means to America, what it means in relation to Black life, what it means in relation to generational wealth and generational trauma due to currency. So um, Mr. Watts, if you're able to give more insight behind the words of your poem based on these thoughts right here that I just shared. Dr. Dunlap, I did just mute Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're fine. Well, I'm so sorry. Could you please repeat the last part of that question for me? Please? No problem. Just um, okay. the motivation and, and, and Can't thoughts. Can't hear you. Can't just hear you. the oh, you oh. have to turn your, remember you turned it down for me? Yes, they're, they're in the oh, okay. same location, everyone. So we're just navigating the uh, tech and, 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 and the sound so you all don't hear an echo. Okay, I get, I get. Nice. Okay, thank you. So just with the words I've shared and the thoughts of currency and Black life and the reality, the, the economic reality in America when it comes to Europeans and Black life, and then for Harriet Tubman to be denied her face on currency, right? Yes, yes. This, the, the relation to Black life and currency in America, was that some motivation behind um, your poetry or, you know, what, what was the motivation behind it when it comes to the reality of economics and currency in Black life in America? Well, I guess the reality was that uh, the European, as you call them, very good. Seeing her image on currency uh, would be basically an insult, an insult to them, basically them thinking that we had a, made some type of a, uh, have arrived, I guess. And because of the, the uh, they've done everything they can to hold us back for years. And I, uh, and everything they've done, even like she said, the uh, the fact that it was squashed, you know, and uh, that's basically it. The fact that it would be offensive towards them for, well, some of them, should I say, not all of them, but some of them anyway. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not. But, uh, you are. You're, you're sharing your inspiration behind exactly your exactly. poetry. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for that because it seems like I have not heard any more, um, I guess, push for the for her right. face to truly be on the $20 bill, which, which is another reason why I think this work is very important because we have to keep and I'm going to say, unfortunately, reminding people that this is our reality. It just some some may get more media attention. Some may not. 
Um, it may happen two, three years in between each other. And it's like this cycle that continues, you know, um, unfortunately we have life or lives taken. We march, we protest, and then someone else is killed, leaving a store most likely, you know, and I'm just still, even I did not truly, like I knew it, but to actually make that scholarly connection to it, that really just, I'm like, wow, it really contributes to the perspective you gain. Yeah. Um, we have about 14 minutes left at this time. I am not seeing any questions. I do want to remind um, our viewers to please make sure you ask your questions in the Q&A. Um, if you're on your phone and the Q&A is too difficult for you to navigate, feel free to put it in the chat. We all are monitoring the chat as well. Um, and at this time, if Dr. Dunlap, if you don't mind just to give people um, a little sample, could you briefly just give us an excerpt um, from the text? Um, you know, we'll give you some time to, you know, um, decide what you would like to share. Um, we're also going to share the link to her text in our chat. Um, and I'm going to ask at this time that the other panelists, as Dr. Dunlap is getting the excerpt prepared, if you can please put your uh, professional information in the chat as well, so our viewers can follow your work, um, your writings, and other conversations that you may have. Um, if you do have an um, Instagram or Twitter that you post your um, scholarship on, or again, your other conversations, please um, share that with our audience as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Ragsdale. I see yours. And Dr. Dunlap, um, you can begin when you are ready. And then I will close us out after that, after last comments from the panel. Thank you. OK, um, I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Helton's story. Uh, which would be on page 39. That's from a story called Misperceived. Okay, and uh, I'm not going to read the whole story, but I'll read a part of it. Okay, so, um, so Alton uh, is someone who works in the ministry and um, he's a very distinguished person and um, uh, he has a lovely wife. They invited me over for dinner so that I could do this interview. So at least I wasn't doing it on an empty stomach. They were so, they were so congenial. And um, uh, this was part of the story, uh, what I'm about to tell you. So keep in mind, he's a reverend. Uh, at that time, he was working in pastoral counseling and um, like a hospital or some kind of institutional environment and also uh, managing his own church, his own facility and so forth. So quite busy, quite engaged with the community and very well respected um, in his community. So he says, I clearly recall, this is uh, Reverend Alton speaking. I clearly recall a situation where I experienced discrimination while shopping. I can't remember exactly the store, but it was a discount dis department store right in town. It was in the 90s, somewhere thereabouts that time. It was a store where I like to go and just sort of tool around because my way of shopping is to just go and look around. I'm probably an impulse buyer, but not in a gross way. But I'll look around and see if I find something. And if so, I'll buy it. I like to do that and that's how I get new things. I was in this store and I was just sort of going through and looking around at different things. And I noticed that I was being followed. And that's not atypical because that is always on my mind as I'm going into a store. It's not typical in that I'll just presume that's going on and almost at a paranoid level where I know that someone's looking at me somewhere. You just know. Black folks know that we are targeted for sur surveillance when we go into stores. But this time the person was just so horribly awkward at it. They were no good at it at all. I would be going down an aisle and they'd be just sort of trailing me and I would look up and I'd see them down in the aisle going around. 
they were just sort of classless about it. And it offended me that they were just so inept. I think I may have been there after work hours, so I may have had my casual way of dressing, especially during the summer with just sort of a t-shirt and a pair of jeans or something like that. I'm just going through and looking around and I see the person. Usually I can maybe let things go, but I didn't want to just let this go this time. So I went up to the person and without cussing or anything, I just said, look, will you do me a favor? If you're going to follow me around, at least be good at it. I can chuckle about it now, but at that time, my tone was, can you just hide a little bit better or something? Actually, to be more specific, what I did was I went up and introduced myself to him. See, this is the way I'll handle things. I said, look, my name is Reverend Alton. I'm a chaplain at a local facility. I'm not here trying to steal anything because that is not anything that I have in mind. And if you're going to follow me, at least do it a little better because it's just embarrassing both for you and for me. In reaction to being followed, I was presenting him my annoyance around it. Some weeks later, it turned out that the guy was a deacon at a church I had been invited to preach at. It was an all white congregation and all, and at a good, and we were having a good time of fellowship. I finished my sermon and thought no more about it, but he saw me. And afterwards, when we met, he said, Reverend, I am so embarrassed, but I was embarrassed also. I initially was a black man in the store who was going to steal everything. So that's a portion of Reverend Alton's story. The story is titled Misperceived. And he goes on to talk about experiences in the bank, um, more, more recent experiences that he's had, um, but I like that story for its humor, um, the humorous way that he resolved it, and then sort of the karma that happened, you know, a couple of weeks later. Um, so. And um, when, I, when I did read that story, I too chuckled. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about how you have to, how they have to be able to put a value on us as human beings based on what we do, you know, because until I know you're a pastor or a good person or, oh, you have a job that contributes to the betterment of society. Oh, you're a good one. We're automatically just assumed to be incompetent, to be criminals, to, to just be uncivilized people. And that's, that's one thing that I love about reading your text is that it, it includes the reality of history and it forces you to remember, you know, it's, it's not a history text guys, but it just, you write so eloquently to where it's stories of the past it's stories of the present it's stories of the future, because unfortunately you may have to write another book. <laughs> unfortunately, you may have to end. And, and I say, unfortunately, because look what you will have to write about. Because we have to be able to continue to tell these stories as they continue to happen. And we can just assume that they're going to continue to happen. So thank I you hope, so much. I, 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 hope. I hope it's going to get better. And um, I, I would just like to say a couple of things. Some of the stories reveal that, well, first of all, not all white people do these things. Um, the white people who reflect on themselves and on their behavior are more likely to be appropriate in their approach is those who think that they are, um, you know, they've taken that diversity class or they watch that documentary or they watch that movie or they have that one black friend or they have a black child or they have a black spouse you, you know, sometimes people get comfortable into thinking that those things make them immune to prejudice and racism. We all, no matter 
what our background is, we need to be willing to constantly, it should be an everyday process where we're evaluating ourselves and we're trying to critique our own selves and ask us, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why was I thinking that? What do I still need to learn? What's inside of me that I need to work on? So I just want to say that in the stories reveal that sometimes people who are not in power, people of color and um, uh, people who have the least amount of privilege in our society sometimes will adopt um, supremacist and privileged ideologies. And so in some of the stories, you have a person of color who's carrying out the inequities upon a person of color. So I don't want you to think that all people in this group are being put over here and all people in that group are being put over there, but we do have a systemic tendency tendency in our society based on, you know, um, the enslavement experience, based on who ended up with power, who ended up with resources, who ends up making all the decisions. But it does not mean that every person is going to think this way or that way and do this and do that. So, but we don't know who we are. That's why we have to be thinking about it. No matter who we are, we have to be evaluating ourselves every day until the day we die. So, um, so once we get comfortable and think that it's not me, that's when we become potentially dangerous to someone else. So I just wanted to say that. I also want people to know that you can find me at drmichelleteaches.com. You can find out about my speaking, my teaching, my, um, my books, um, where my books are located, um, my community work. All of that is in drmichelleteaches.com. Thank you. Dr. Fontenet. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm actually putting the Amazon link to your book in the chat right now. Um, feel free to put any other platform, Dr. Dunlap, that you um, encourage that, people to purchase from. Everything is, they can find out everything they need to know from drmichelleteaches.com. Nice, beautiful. Thank so you. at this time, yes, I know that we're two minutes until ending. However, I'm okay if it takes an extra minute or two for you all to give your closing comments. So at this time, I'm going to ask for each panelist to please just close us out with just some words that you would like to leave our viewers with. Okay, yeah. I'll stop. Oh, doctor, oh, please, oh. Dr. Baxdale, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. So you go ahead. No, you know, on Zoom, you can't see what other people are about to do till they get on the screen. Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I was uh, just wanted to, to share my gratitude for, for doing the book, for bringing um, forward this uh, phenom and for, you know, helping us to cope, to think about this experience that is like, as we were talking about, has been so normalized for us. Not, not, in, not in this country, probably throughout the world, the African diaspora, because it's so connected to, 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 to capitalism and the exploitation of the black body. So I wanted to, to, to share my gratitude and my, and my, thankfulness for you to take the time to, to, to do such a powerful book. And uh, just you know, my heart just really goes out to, to you and the participants of the book. And thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you so much, Dr. Ragsdale. Mr. Ross? Again, uh, thank you, Michelle. Hold on, sorry. And I'm very proud of her because it takes a whole lot of courage to um, address the topic that's very as sensitive as racism. And she's done, she's doing a great job. I'm very proud of her. And again, thank you, Dr. Alicia. I wish you the best. Oh, we can't hear you. Yes, let's unmute you, Dr. Rex. I'm sorry, Dr. Dunlap. I'm so sorry. I would first like to say thanks to God. I thank God for everything. And God gave me. Um, the whole structure and everything for the book. Um, so I would like to say thanks to God. Thanks to the National Council of Black Studies for having me here today. Thank you for 
my two um, very distinguished and talented uh, guests who came uh, with me today. Thank you, Dr. Fontenet. And I would like to thank all of the audience, the participants. I can't see you. I don't know who you are, but I am so grateful for you. And I thank you so very much. Again, thank you all so much. And Dr. Dunlap, just to further what Dr. Ragsdale has said, as well as Mr. Watts, um, knowing that this was something you too were working, were working on during the pandemic. And then we have all these traumatic experiences happening um, as a Black community. So for you to have the strength and the endurance, the will to work on this project during such a traumatic time for everyone in the world, um, that really means a lot. And know that your work is needed. Um, and we're going to continue to have this conversation because again, I'm a mother and we are fathers and- And grandmothers. And grandmas and this, this just has to stop. And hopefully we see it during our lifetimes, mm -hmm. but you know, we will not see it without work like what you are doing, Dr. Ragsdale, as well as Mr. Watts. Thank you all so much. Um, this will be posted to our NCBS YouTube channel. It um, is already posted on our Facebook page. So you can feel free to share this. Let's make this conversation go viral. And we will have one more community conversation at the end of June. That information will be coming out shortly. Um, after that, we will take a break in July, but we will resume back um, in August. And it's so um, ironic that you all talked about the trauma in our experiences and writing this because the fall seminar, our community discussion will discuss um, how to stay mentally healthy with this type of work. Um, those of us who teach it, those of us who write about it, those of us who create art about it, um, you know, scholarships. So please be on the lookout for that. And thank you all so much for attending tonight's community conversation with the National Council for Black Studies. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.